Hello, I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. With me today is Dr. William A. Goodch, Jr., chairman and associate astronomer in our Department of Astronomy, the American Museum Hayden Planetarium. And I think Bill can tell me about that beautiful, brilliant object that's up in the western sky in the early evenings this spring. We are getting lots of phone calls, as we always do, about that. And, of course, that's the planet Venus. And at times like this, it's the brightest object in the sky except for the sun and the moon. It's very bright for two reasons. One, it's totally covered with clouds, which reflect the sun's light very well. And secondly, it's uh, the closest planet to us most of the time. Interestingly, some people say that's the evening star, thinking that there is one and only one evening star, and it is Venus. Yeah, we tend to use the word star loosely here, but we use it to refer actually to the planets, which move around and sometimes are in the evening and sometimes are in the morning sky. Our solar system has uh, nine planets, of which we are one, all similar bodies. Is there any chance we might discover another planet in the solar system? That's always a possibility, and occasionally people think they may have uh, found some evidence for it. We, we see, or we try to look for tugging on the outer planets from things that may be beyond a gravitational pull. But uh, Pluto took decades to find, and if we're talking about something beyond Pluto, we're really talking about a needle in the cosmic haystack. Uh, aside from the technical interest of an astronomer in finding it, I guess the popular interest in looking for new planets is kind of to answer that question, is there life somewhere else? That's right, because really when it comes to life in the universe, we really only have a statistic of one right now, the Earth, and, and having explored the other planets in our own solar system quite thoroughly, it seems as though uh, we're probably the only planet with life of any kind here. Recently, we've begun to make some, some interesting strides at looking for planets around other stars, however. And have we found anything that suggests that we may not be the only solar system? Some fairly strong evidence has now come in that there may be a planet uh, several times the mass of Jupiter in orbit around a star called Van Biesbroek 8. Also within the last year or two, we've discovered certainly clouds of material around a few other stars, including Fomalhaut, Vega, Beta Pictoris, and these could well be solar systems in the process of formation. I know that philosophically the discussion has always led to the conclusion that there are just so many stars, there have got to be more solar systems. But now we're getting down to the point where we may be beginning to see some evidence that they're really there. That's right. One more step on the way to finding out if there really may be life out there. Thank you, Bill. With me today was Dr. William Gutsch, chairman in the American Museum Hayden Planetarium. I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. Hello, I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Talking to me by telephone is Richard Gordon, a well-known photographer. He's also a very frequent contributor to our Natural History magazine. In uh, one of the most recent issues of Natural History, Richard illustrated and produced for us a story about the Year of the Ox, the Chinese New Year celebration for the current year. Uh, Richard, when does the Chinese New Year take place? Well, the Chinese New Year falls on the lunar calendar. It's the first day for the lunar calendar. So usually it's sometime in late January or early February. So that the date of the Chinese New Year depends upon the phase of the moon. Right. And the period between two successive New Years depends upon how many lunar cycles take place in that interval, either 12 or 13, depending on the year. Why are Chinese New Year's named after an ox or some other animal? They have 13 symbolic animals. Every year is paired up with one of these animals, and they keep rotating around. And each animal usually has certain connotations. When a young couple is going to get married, that's one of the things that a, a geomancer or the families think about. Is A tiger wouldn't work well with an ox, for example. What, what's so special about the ox and is this expected to give some kind of a flavor to the year that is the year of the ox? People tend to say the same things they do about the year that they would about an ox, that it's a, a time of stability, a time oh. of progress and growth. So the Chinese New Year, like ours, is a very happy event. Oh, very happy. The story that I did in the magazine is, is mainly focused on the countryside, and this is really where the New Year takes off. Seven days a week in the countryside, people work, and New Year's is really the only time that they stop working for an entire two-week period and let their hair down, really have a big vacation, get together with their families, and have all sorts of activities and celebrations. 
Uh, there's a very commonly known Chinese method of celebrating with a kind of a, uh, an imaginary lion dressed up around a group of people. Usually there'll be two men inside of a great lion suit and another man prancing all about carrying a ball and flirting with the lion. Is music a part of the Chinese New Year celebration, an important part of it? Oh, a very big part. Every parade needs music. Every wedding needs music. It's also a time when they have most of the weddings of the year. And so these local traditional bands will get together and uh, lead the parade off. Thank you, Richard. With me today was Richard Gordon, photographer and frequent contributor to Natural History Magazine, the journal of the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. Hello, I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. With me today is Marie A. Lawrence. Uh, Marie is senior scientific assistant in the Department of Mammalogy at the American Museum. She's helping us work on an exhibition that will describe animals in motion. I know Marie has learned a great deal about animal motion in the process. Most people think of running and walking immediately, but animals fly, they swim, mm -hmm. they glide, they burrow in the ground. One of the most fascinating things about mammals is the variation in the ways they can move. And similar motions, too. I noticed your reference that uh, burrowing animals are really swimming through the earth. And they're adapted to swim through the earth. The motion is very similar to a right. human swimming in water. Another group of animals that always puzzle people in the way they move are snakes, who don't seem to have limbs, but they, they move. They glide. Now, the, that's because of the adaptations in their muscle system, am I correct? Muscle and skeletal system. Uh -huh. Essentially, there's a spinal the column. backbone. <laughs> and the length of the snake, they propel themselves with a back and forth movement. Again, I have to refer to swimming. How many ways do animals adapt to the process of flying? Are there great variations? Yes. Birds have adapted the forearm from the shoulder out to the fingertips right. into what we call a wing. Yep. The mammals that fly, or there's really only one mammal that, that really flies, the bat, they have adapted what amounts to just the fingers into a uh, webbed structure. They actually move like the wings of a bird. There's a gliding adaptation that are in things like flying lemurs and flying squirrels. The exhibition that we're planning this year, based on the great mounts produced by the anatomist uh, Chubb, what kinds of animals are you going to show in the exhibition? There'll be horses, dogs, uh, donkey, wolf. And the point is to show how their anatomy has been adapted to the kinds of motion for which they're best known. Yes, and also to show exactly how the skeletal system coordinates in movement. And it's different for different kinds of motion, even in the same animal. For example, I gather there are going to be at least two different kinds of horses in the exhibition. Race horse, a work horse, and there's even a third one. Are there differences in adaptation between those two and the third you mentioned? There are more differences between the workhorse and the racehorse. Uh -huh. Workhorses were bred for power, large, heavy bones. People today are not too familiar with workhorses. And racehorses have, uh, I think someone used the term that they've been bred as running machines. And is that a fair statement? I think so. Thank you, Marie. With me today is Marie Lawrence, Senior Scientific Assistant in the Department of Mammalogy at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Tom Nicholson, Director of the Museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And this is the year in which we will be celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of a very important man, John James Audubon. And with me today is Miss Mary LaCroix. Uh, Mr. LaCroix is senior scientific assistant in the Department of Ornithology at the American Museum and knows a great deal about Audubon. Mary, what are the greatest contributions that Audubon made to the understanding of birds? His main contribution was painting birds life-size in their natural habitat. He brought the field into the library. Most of the paintings of birds that had been published before his time were profiles of birds with no background or with very little or very stylized background. 
one of his early problems was putting the birds in a position that would be lifelike. And he developed a technique for wiring the birds into this lifelike position to hold them there artificially while he painted. Audubon is remembered today for this great work that he produced called Birds of America, which has survived in relatively few copies, but which is an extremely beautiful and extremely valuable set of bird pictures. His life wasn't that all easy, am I correct? At the age of about 40, he decided to publish a work that would give to the public all of the birds known in North America at that time. Prior to that, he spent many years of wandering around from one business venture to another and from one failure to another. One other interesting aspect of the Audubon story is the extent to which the American Museum holds some very significant Audubon memorabilia in addition to copies of the prints themselves. Two of Audubon's granddaughters gave us quite a number of original paintings, both by Audubon and by his son, John Woodhouse Audubon, and important memorabilia that they owned. Most of the original watercolors for Birds of America are at the New York Historical Society, uh, but the copper plates from which they were printed, a strange story occurred with respect to them, am I right? They were sold as scrap copper because Mrs. Audubon was in financial straits. These were saved from being melted down at the very last moment. I know we're quite proud to hold 12 of the original we copper do. plates. We're using six of these copper plates to re reproduce some of the prints from the Audubon folio in partial celebration of Audubon's anniversary. Thank you, Mary. With me today was Mary LaCroix, Senior Scientific Assistant in the Department of Ornithology at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Tom Nicholson, Director of the Museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. Hello. I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and with me today is Dr. Jerome G. Rosen, Jr., curator in the Department of Entomology. And Jerry has just had a very interesting opportunity presented to him. He's naming a bee after his wife. Jerry, how does that come about? Well, my wife, Barbara, is an entomologist. When entomologists go out to find uh, insects, they find many new species, and we really have to look hard for names. So Are you going to name it Barbara? I'm going to name it Barbary. How do you name a bee? As with all animals and all plants, you give it actually two names. There is a generic name and a species name. Name them. The genus, in this case, is the genus Oreopocytes, so it'll be uh -huh. Oreopocytes barberi. Is there a family name, too? Oh, yes. This belongs to a very large family of bees, the family Anthophorty. And uh, all bees have that family name? Oh, no, no, no. There are, oh, about 10 families of bees. Well, after all, there are about 21,000 species of bees. You have made a lifelong study of bees. That's your field. You're the, called a hymenopterist? I'm called correct? a hymenopterist, uh, an mm -hmm. apoidologist, to be more specific. All bees are, are apoidia. To the hymenopter belong many other groups of things oh, that people know about. I For see. example, wasps and ants belong to the hymenoptera, and indeed, a bee is nothing but a specialized kind of wasp. What is a specialized kind of wasp? Well, we think that about 120 million years ago, bees started to evolve, and they evolved from a group of wasps. And the occasion was the development of angiosperms, the flowering plants. And this permitted a group of wasps to take advantage of this new food source, and they've been with it ever since. Almost all bees feed upon pollen and nectar. A whole new evolutionary trend took place, which has produced the diverse kinds of bees that we now find in the world. Are they generally widespread throughout the world? Yes, they are, except, of course, like many insects, they like the warmer parts of the world. The peculiar thing about bees is that in rainforest, they aren't particularly abundant, but in desert regions, they are. Are all bees worldwide just like ours in, in form and size and habits, etc.? Oh, no. There's only one bee that is found, for example, in the New World and in the Old World both. And that's the common honeybee, and that was introduced to the New World. I see. Uh, can you give me some idea of the variations in, in size and habits and characteristics? Well, the largest bee is probably several inches long. And then there are tiny bees also, uh, ones that are an eighth of an inch long. Matter of fact, Oreopocytes barbary is one of the smallest bees in the world and it is found near the Museum Southwestern Research Station in Arizona. Insects in general are poorly studied, uh, whereas uh, vertebrates, things like birds, are very well studied. It's very hard to find a new species of bird. It is fa rather easy to find a new species of bee. The trouble is that once you find it, you have to recognize it as being a new species. Thank you, Jerry. With me today is Dr. Jerome G. Rosen, Jr., 
Deputy Director for Research and Curator in the Department of Entomology at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Tom Nicholson, Director of the Museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. Hello, I'm Tom Nicholson, Director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. With me today is Dr. George E. Harlow, Associate Curator in the Department of Mineral Sciences at the museum. George is a mineralogist, and one thing George knows is that all that's green is not jade. Am I right, George? That's quite right, Tom. I've seen a lot of things advertised and sold as, quote, jade, unquote, for very, very low prices. Are they really jade? The term jade is a, is a nebulous term and does not really describe a unique substance. Uh, there are two different materials that are traditionally called jade, one called jadeite and the other called nephrite. The material that is of the greatest historical interest would be nephrite, which is the material that the Chinese have carved for on the order of four or five thousand years. Is that one of its characteristics? It carves well? That is the thing that makes it most interesting. It is basically much like fiberglass. It has an interlocking structure of fibers that make it very, very durable. And among the things we purchase as jade objects is nephrite, the more common mineral used. Yes. Tell us something about the second class of so-called jade, what you described as jadeite. Jadeite owes its history to the Mesoamerican Indians, to the Olmecs and the Maya. And materials was first found by the conquistadors when they took over uh, Mesoamerica, basically Central America and Mexico. Is jadeite more difficult to carve? In terms of their physical hardnesses, they're quite comparable in hardness. The difference is nephrite is very durable and tenacious and tends to hold its shape and not break apart. Jadeite, on the other hand, can often have cracks in it or it has a natural tendency to break and consequently it will not hold intricate forms. You can carve big objects out of it pretty readily, but if you make a ring out of jadeite, you'll find after you've worn it a while that it's broken in two and you don't, don't have a ring drop anymore. It. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> I see. Be careful. Now, of the two, nephrite and jadeite, I gather that jadeite makes the more valuable objects. Is that correct? If you get it in the right color, it is more valuable, probably mostly because it is rarer. A great many objects that are described as valuable jades and probably are jadeites appear almost milky in color with the uh, slight threads of color through it. Right. Am I correct? That's correct. Yeah. The more of the emerald green that you yeah. find, that's often referred to as imperial jadeite, and that's the most precious material. Pieces which have a uniform emerald green color with a high degree of translucency. Thank you, George. With me today was Dr. George Harlow, Associate Curator, Department of Mineral Sciences at the American Museum, and I'm Tom Nicholson, Director of the American Museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these few listening minutes with you. I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and with me today is Dr. Neil Landman. Neil is assistant curator in the Department of Invertebrates, and he works with animals, some of which became extinct when the dinosaurs became extinct. Neil, some of the animals you work with are those that were called ammonites. Yeah, that's correct. Ammonites are shelled animals, and they're all extinct today, and they lived in ancient seas. They're similar to snails and clams, but mm -hmm. uh, unlike these animals, the ammonites probably were able to float in the water and swim around. And today there's one close living relative, and that is the pearly nautilus, which lives in the Pacific. Most people are familiar with uh, the nautilus, a very lovely coiled shell with a chambered structure. And the ammonites had a similar structure. Many of the ammonites were coiled, others were straight shelled. I think I've seen some fossils of coiled ammonites that were quite large, am I correct? Yeah, ammonites uh, could reach as much as two, three meters as coiled forms. Two or three meters would be taller than a man can stand, wouldn't it? That right, would they're, they're enormous. Are nautiloids also found in the fossil record in the same period in which we find ammonites? The nautiloids probably gave rise to the ammonites. During the, their combined history, the ammonites were much more abundant and much more varied in their shape and form than the nautiloids. There's an interesting story told in the history of the two animals, though one group, the ammonites, were declining, while the other group, the nautiloids, were increasing both in diversity and numbers. 
it's been a, a real question, why did the ammonites become extinct, but the nautiloids uh, survive until today? One hypothesis I've advanced is that if you look at the early life history of an ammonite, it would have hatched at a very small size, something like a millimeter, one twenty-fifth of an inch. Mm -hmm. And at such a small size, it would have probably been part of the surface water plankton. Whereas today's nautilus, studying that, it hatches at a much larger size, about two and a half centimeters, 25 times as large, about an inch. And it apparently lives in deep water and becomes an active swimmer. So it would appear that whatever could have caused the catastrophe in the surface water plankton would have differentially affected the ammonites because in their early life history they would have been part of that plankton community, whereas the nautilus-like animals would have been deeper and would have been actively swimming. How do the nautiloids move in water? They, they look like such simple animals. Um, they have an organ called a hyponome through which they eject water. And they are jet propelled backwards in the water. They can move horizontally and we've also been able to record vertical movements. So we're looking at animals that invented jet propulsion and the principles of the submarine a good many millions of years ago. That's right. Thank you, Neil. With me today is Dr. Neil Landman, assistant curator in the Department of Invertebrates at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. With me today is Dr. Richard Zweifel. Dr. Zweifel is curator and formerly chairman in the Department of Herpetology at the American Museum of Natural History. And Dick's going to tell us something about a mountain of discoveries. What mountain is that, Dick? This is Cerro de la Neblina, which is a sandstone plateau and mountain that rises some 9,000 feet out of the rainforests of the Brazil-Venezuelan border in southern Venezuela. Would you translate the name for me? It means Mountain of the Mist. Now, I gather that there's a fairly broad-based study being taken of the mountain and the surrounding area. How many people are involved in this exploration of the Mountain of the Mist? Several dozen. We estimate that this year alone there will be something like 80 scientists. Not all from the American Museum, of course. Several institutions are cooperating in this, the American Museum, the Smithsonian, the New York Botanical Garden. Numerous other institutions are contributing. Both in the United States and in Venezuela. Yes. Now, what's their goal in studying the Mountain of the Mists? Part of the goal is to find out what lives in the rainforest there. Part of the goal is to find out what lives in isolation atop the mountain. By the rainforest, you mean in the surrounding valleys and uh, lowlands? Yes, this is Amazonian rainforest that stretches okay. for thousands of miles. Your objective, basically, then, is to um, identify and compare the living forms that are found on the mountain with the surrounding area. Is that correct? Yes, it's the old study of isolation that has fascinated biologists since Darwin's time. These uh, tepuis, these various peaks tepuis as they are called, are islands of high, cool, misty country in a sea of hot, moist rainforest. In a romantic sense, we would call them laboratories of evolution. I suppose the first problem is to find what's there, and that's what you're doing now. This is the, one of the main thrusts of rainforest research throughout the world, because the rainforests are being destroyed at a horrendous rate and along with them, the species that live in them. Now, are there many differences between uh, the living forms you find on the mountaintop and those in the valleys? A great many differences. It takes an animal equipped to live in a cool, moist environment to live on top, and it's difficult to be adapted to such diverse conditions as a rainforest and a cool plateau. We know, for example, that most of the few kinds of amphibians and reptiles we collected on top are new to science. They're ones that have never been collected before. Mm -hmm. And this is probably true of a lot of the plants, too and certainly of insects. Thank you, Dick. With me today is Dr. Richard Zweifel, curator in the Department of Herpetology at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. Hello, I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Talking to me by telephone is Dr. C. Lavitt-Smith, a curator in the Department of Ichthyology at the American Museum. Dr. Smith is interested in what fish eat, specifically what kind of appetites they have. Smitty, I gather that fish use a wide variety of uh, food sources from the sea, is that correct? 
they tend to be opportunistic feeders, and they feed on whatever is easiest for them to get. That's given us a lot of trouble because a lot of fish have very pronounced specializations, specialized teeth, specialized mouth shapes, specialized head forms. Designed specifically to eat certain kinds of foods. Well, it would appear that way. The problem is that when we look in their stomachs, we find out that they feed on whatever is most abundant at the time. Would it be fair to say that most fish are omnivorous? Not exactly omnivorous, because fish tend not to feed very much on plant material. Why do they avoid the eating of plant foods? Well, plant cells have cellulose walls, and in order to get at the protoplasm in the cell, these walls have to be either broken down by enzymes or cracked, and, and fish don't have the enzymes to do it, so they have to have some sort of a grinding mechanism that will crush the cells so that their digestive enzymes can get to the material inside. Do fish eat, as well as uh, soft-bodied materials, do they also eat the, the hard-bodied animals, like lobsters? And uh... Yes, they do, and, and fish that do eat lobsters and uh, shellfish and mollusks will have teeth that are shaped like molars or uh, pavement teeth. Uh, rays, for example, have teeth that look like an inlaid tile mosaic. They're very pretty teeth, actually. Some fish uh, don't have teeth at all, is that correct? Well, at least they don't have teeth in their mouth. Most fish that lack teeth in the mouth will have a set of teeth at the back of the gills, called pharyngeal teeth. And these teeth will either be grinders or have strong hooks for tearing. You mentioned to me a fish that eats sort of like a saw, is that correct? There's a little shark that has saw-like teeth, and when it opens its mouth, it forms almost a perfect circle of these teeth and it'll get a hold of um, its prey and twist its body and just cut out a, a circular area. We call this the cookie cutter shark. Do fish have regular eating hours? Most of them have periods when they're more active than, than other times. One of the ways that we pack more fish into a small area is to stagger their feeding hours, just the way we, we do it in schools and hospitals and factories. Thank you, Smitty. With me today was Dr. C. Lavitt-Smith, curator in the Department of Ichthyology at the American Museum of Natural History, and I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. Hello, I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. With me today is Michael W. Clemens. Michael is senior scientific assistant in our Department of Herpetology. He has an interest in, in many different kinds of animals, but one in particular led him on a search for a needle in one of the biggest haystacks I've ever heard about, the state of Massachusetts. What animal were you looking for in Massachusetts, Michael? I was looking for the bog turtle. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about what a bog turtle is first? Okay, a bog turtle is a rather small turtle, no more than four inches long. It's extremely secretive. It occurs very spotly over the eastern seaboard and is considered rare and endangered in many areas. Uh, one would not ordinarily expect to find one in his backyard or in his local park. No. Why did you choose Massachusetts to look for the bog turtle? Well, it had success in discovering bog turtle populations in neighboring Connecticut, and the people from the Massachusetts Fish and Wildlife and the Nature Conservancy in Massachusetts contacted me and asked if I would try to discover if there were any populations in adjacent parts of Massachusetts. Really, I guess they were interested in seeing how widely dispersed the animals were. Uh, would that have been a unique locality to find the, the bog turtle, Massachusetts, as opposed, for example, to Connecticut and New Hampshire? Uh, they wouldn't occur in New Hampshire. This may be the most northern site for the bog turtle in the so country. So you were playing around with the northern limits at which the animal has previously been found. Right. They are still found in, in portions of northwest Connecticut, and they're still found in adjoining portions of New York State, a little bit further south. Other populations seem to have been destroyed by changes in the wetlands, filling of wetlands, and also change in vegetation patterns. Bog turtle is a very complex ecology which is connected to a whole variety of wetland species, and when these species disappear, the bog turtle often disappears. It's rare, so it's also collected by people because of its rarity. Mm. So there are many, many factors. It's, it requires a very complicated, balanced habitat, and the slightest disruption to water flow or amount of nutrients entering the habitat can seriously affect its suitability for this species. It's not tolerant of ecological disturbance. What led you to the place where you found the bog turtles in Massachusetts? 
uh, the geology and drainage patterns, as well as the type of vegetation. So while this was a pretty big haystack, you, you had a fair idea what corner to look in. Thank you, Michael. With me today was Michael Clemens, scientific assistant in the Department of Herpetology at the American Museum of Natural History. And I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. With me today is Dr. Ethel Toback, the curator in the Department of Mammalogy. Ethel is trained as a comparative psychologist and knows a great deal about many different kinds of animals. One of the animals she studies is the sea hare. Tell us a little bit about a sea hare, what it is and where it lives. The sea hare is a marine snail-like animal which is found in all the warm waters of the world. Mm -hmm and it looks very much like a browsing rabbit. One of the interesting characteristics of the sea hare, I understand, are some of the substances that the sea hare gives off. Can you describe them for me? If you've ever been in a coral reef or mangrove area and stepped on something that suddenly released the cloud of purple into the water, mm -hmm. that is what's called the ink that the sea hare gives off. But the sea hare isn't the only kind of animal that does that. No, I the octopus, the squid, the cuttlefish, they also give off ink, but it's a different kind of ink. Different kind in what way? It's different biochemically, uh -huh. and it's different in its purpose, in the sense that when the squid, the octopus give off the ink, usually it's when they're being preyed upon by some animal that's about to eat them. This is what is thought to be a defense mechanism right. on the part of the animal. Yeah. But in the case of the sea hare, this is the mystery that we're interested in. Well, why don't they defend themselves with the same substance? Because nothing eats them. We have a few cases in evolution in which somehow or other behavior patterns that seem to have no value to the animal persist in the animal species. At least we find nothing preys on them today, correct? Exactly. Yeah. The ink they give off may be a remnant of a problem they had unknown millions of years ago. That's not the only substance that the sea hare secretes, though, is no. it? No. Now, that's what's interesting. It also has a toxic substance in a gland called the opaline gland. And this is really a neurotoxin which will uh, interfere with the muscular activity of crabs and small fish and so on. The question is, is this something that, again, does protect the animal from a relationship that we don't know about at this point? So that that's one of the reasons we go out in the field to see what animals we find living near the sea here, feeding in the same area, in some way relating to the sea here, so that perhaps the substances act as warning signals so that we look to see if the animal gives off these substances when there's really no immediate contact with a so-called predator. Mm -hmm. And we think that that may happen because the one experiment we did with sea anemones showed that if the sea hare and sea anemone come a little close to each other, they withdraw from each other. Mm -hmm. Now, the sea anemone does give off uh, material that is toxic. So, so both may sense one another chemically. Exactly. Thank you, Ethel. With me today was Dr. Ethel Toback, curator in the Department of Mammalogy at the American Museum of Natural History, and I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. Hello, I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. With me today is Dr. Linda Mantell, research associate in the Department of Invertebrates at the museum. And Linda and I wish to discuss an aspect of pollution and its effects that many of us don't often think of. Not so much the effects of pollutants directly on the welfare of humans, but rather on the food chain on which humans depend, specifically on seafood. There are many different ways in which pollutants can affect what we consider to be seafood. Is that right? Some of the noticeable effects, of course, are the lethal effects. However, there are other more subtle, longer-term effects. Something may happen which affects their growth, their reproduction, and their part in the biological community, as well as affecting the commercial catch of important species like blue crabs and certain kinds of fish. Pollutants tend to concentrate in the succulent and luscious parts of things like crabs and lobsters. These are the tissues that will accumulate things like hydrocarbons, which we know are deleterious both to 
the animal in which they're living, and to us if we ingest too much. Now, we can be selective in the parts of the animals we may eat, but clams, oysters, uh, mussels, uh, that's another problem. We get it all. That's right. You take your chances every time you eat one of those yummy raw oysters. You described the several different kinds of effects that result from pollutants. Uh, one of them, I gather, is a change in the rate of molting or the way in which molting takes place. That's right. We've done for several years a study on juvenile blue crabs from Barnegat Bay, New Jersey. Now, Barnegat Bay is still a relatively clean area. We've gone down and collected crabs from old fingernail size on up to an inch or two across, kept them in the laboratory, and seen how long it takes them to molt, that is, to shed their exoskeleton and grow to the next larger size. Normally, these animals in their first summer will molt four or five times. However, if we expose these juveniles, these babies, to low concentrations of hydrocarbons like benzene and naphthalene, we find that they may molt only once during the summer. And at the end of the summer, instead of being a good size, healthy juvenile, they're probably not going to make it. They're too small and might be picked off by some predator. The gills, of course, are very important in all these water-breathing animals, whether it's mollusks or crustaceans. And what happens in the gills is that their structure becomes disorganized. They get growths on the gill coverings. They're not able to extract oxygen from the water. They can't grow, and they are not carrying out their part in the food chain. Thank you, Linda. With me today was Dr. Linda Mantell, research associate in the Department of Invertebrates at the American Museum of Natural History, and I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you. Hello. I'm Tom Nicholson, director at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And we're here today to talk about whether birds talk and how. And with me to discuss the subject is Dr. Lester Short, curator and chairman in the Department of Ornithology at the museum. Les, I understand that birds can imitate, at least some birds, a wide range of sounds. How do they do it? Well, they do it because of the structure of their voice box, or syrinx, as it's technically called which is peculiar to birds and which varies a lot in birds. Why do birds imitate other sounds in nature? Some birds imitate as a means of scaring away possible predators by imitating certain calls that the predators, that the predators might don't fear. like. <laughs> and they pick these up and uh, do it regularly. For instance, the blue jay yeah. has a call uh, very much like certain hawks. Others build the mimicry into a particular individualistic song of its own, which then tells everybody in the neighborhood precisely who that bird is every time he sings. This isn't true of all birds, that is the tendency to mimic. Uh, many birds' uh, songs are primarily related to the species they belong to, am I correct? Right, many are stereotyped, and of course mimicry itself implies learning. These are things that have to be added on to the basic genetic uh, potential for the sound making that they have. I, is there an inheritability in, in the vocalization patterns that birds make? There's a certain base, uh, which is relatively complete in some species, mm -hmm. and they don't change very much. In others, it's modified during the first few weeks of life, and then not again. In others, it's modified throughout their life. Most of us know about the parrot and its attempts to mimic human voices, but are there any other birds that have this unique capability you'd like to, to mention? Well, surely the mockingbird, it indeed has uh, vast capabilities of mimicry, of course, always of the things that it does here. They have uh, picked I heard as that. many as 167 different species that have been imitated by oh. mockingbirds. You mentioned to me uh, several birds that like to mimic a train whistle. Yes, these are picked up uh, by several species, most notably the lyrebird in Australia, which uh -huh. is an inveterate mimic, and it takes on various human vocal sounds, dog uh, barking and other sounds that it builds into a vast repertory that is used for a certain period of the year almost continuously. Do you have an example of that sound? Yes, I have right here. I'll play it for you. Uh, thank you, Les. With me today is Dr. Lester Short, chairman and curator in the Department of Ornithology at the American Museum of Natural History. And I'm Tom Nicholson, director of the museum in New York City. It's been a pleasure spending these listening moments with you.